Drew, welcome. How are you? Good. Really, really good, actually. Yeah, feeling a really, really good place at the moment. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming on. I've been really excited to have this conversation. It was about 18 months ago I came across your book, And Then What? Um, and we've, we've spoken about this previously before where the impact it had on me was significant in that it was the first time I'd actually read about someone who'd been there in the dirt and come out on the other side of mm. the search, the fear, the pain that we all go through at some points in our lives, but come with such a clear understanding and then using that to help others. And mm. I'm, I'm not much of a reader, to be honest. I, I listen to a lot of podcasts. I listen to a lot of books, but actually reading takes me a long time. And I finished your book in two days. Normally it takes me months to get through anything. And if that shows anything, how important it actually, it was to me and where I am today. So thank you for your time. And it's great to have you on. No, thank you. It's a, it's a lovely testimony. I, I it, it's always a, I remember writing it and, you know, it's the same with anything, isn't it? performance social media now fear 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 just grabs you many times i was writing that thinking who the hell wants to read this crap and, and it's no good and you know no one wants to read this misery and you know <laughs> it really drew you that enlightened what the hell are you going to tell anybody and you just failed you never made the premier league i mean some of the voices but but yes so it's a really nice test of you know, and i've had quite a few of those actually it's lovely um i know there's typos in the book and there's mistakes but and I think the energy that I wanted to put in it was just just that authenticity, um, just that just that real truth. Uh, and you said something there was interesting. I was just thinking about being in the dirt, and everyone can relate to that. I, I'm not sure everyone can relate to that. I, I think I think I think there's a lot of people who have tough times, and of course, all, all kinds of things financially or, or with health, or but to to really almost drive yourself to rock bottom through over analysis through this burning desire and, and not being able to control it and i think that's that's quite a unique the wrong word but it's quite a rare thing yeah that's actually i think that's what makes your story so special to be honest in that it's come from an internal place where you've actually driven yourself there and you started out as a really talented young footballer you're coming through with some pretty big names in the england under 20 mm. squad um mm. you've I believe you almost made a Premier League team at the age of 16. Is that right? 60, yeah, I was at Norwich City from the age of 10. And I remember, you know, um, 16, 16 years of age, you know, we, 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 it was, I was up there training at the club just before Christmas and uh, it was kind of school holidays and they were, they were taking a final look at the 16s because we were going to be leaving school that, that, that summer and, and coming in full time as young professionals two years to try and convince everyone we were good enough for a professional contract. And, you know, so it was that last kind of, and, and it was the first time all the first team staff <clears throat> had eyes on the, on the 16 year olds. Cause of course they're, they're worried about the first team. And I, I happened to, to, to play in a game and score three goals and the first team had lost a couple of games and they were looking for some inspiration. They thought, who's this kid? Like, there's no respect for anybody, technically good. And, and word came around. I was asked to, we all got in the showers and we were heading home that day. Mine was a two, a, two and a half hour train journey and the head of the youth just go, Drew, if you could just stay behind. And all the guys were like, well, what's this? What's this? And they all, off they went. And I'm standing there thinking, what have I done? Am I in trouble? And he explained to me that the first team staff had a meeting and they wanted me on the bench on that was Thursday on the Sunday against Everton in the Premier League. And I, I'm going home to see my mum and my brothers. And, you know, that was, you know, that, that, that was a moment where you're thinking, I remember he drove me home because he wanted to explain that to my mum and just reassess where I'm at. And he kind of said to them, no, he's not ready. Um, and I've shared that with a couple of people. I said, that's harsh. That would have been a great opportunity, but, I think in truth, I probably wasn't ready. Um, but, but yeah, I think what that, still to this day, but I think what that showed me, and this, this, these, these are the internal battles many times. Obviously, you're then 24, 25, 26. You're drowning out there on the pitch. You can't find it. And then you'd go, but 16. These people who are highly experienced in the, in the, in the, in the game were looking and going, he's got something. And, and at 18 was the same. And at 19, and... So they can't have been wrong, all these people. That they're, they're experienced people, um, and that, but I'm sure you've been there, and that, that that almost builds more pain and more pressure because you're then searching even harder to find it. Um, tough, tough thing. Yeah, and that's it. And if you're so you're averaging 25 goals a season until you're 18, 
and then all yeah. of a sudden moving into the next phase of your career when you're meant to be getting better and better each year. You know how good you are. You've seen that. People are telling you how good you are. Yet the next sort of 10 to 12 years of your career didn't quite pan out. So if you're going, you've literally halved the amount, less than half actually, the amount of goals a probably season. A th- prob- probably a third. I reckon I averaged eight wow. goals a season. Eight. eight. For, and, and 25 was being conservative. I was probably scoring more than that a season, maybe 30. You know, and, and I don't know if you know, but in football, if you're a 20 goal a season strike, I mean, Ronaldo and Messi have moved it on to a whole nother level now. It used to be, if you're a 20 goal a season striker, you're in the top echelon of, of, of centre forwards. Alan Shearer, obviously the Premier League record goal scorer, hit the, th- hit the 30 numbers. Um, Thierry Henry took it up. A p- and then obviously Messi and Ronaldo have come in and shooting 50 a year. It's ridiculous. But yeah, if you're hitting anywhere between 20 and 30, you're in the top, top echelon of sense forwards yeah and then you well you mentioned earlier that so you're, you're hitting this but then you start searching so mm. what what is it that you are searching for 25 goals <laughs> <laughs> well, where did they go where did they yeah. go yeah because that that they, they, they're linked to everything you know to, you, you, the ambition that you have you're a young player you want to get to the top well how do you get to the top? Scoring goals. You know, scoring goals is what's going to get someone to buy you back to the next level and the next level and get you to the Premier League, you know, that, and then get you in the England team. It's going to be, you know, if you're in sales, it, you've got to sell and you've got to smash the targets and that's what it's going to take. And, and you know, that, that, that's what I was searching for. Um, and of course, you know, you, I went down absolutely every single rabbit hole 10 times and tr- dug new ones and, you know, scratched around in the dirt, looking at everything, everything, psychology, um, psychotherapy. Um, I think the biggest thing I probably searched, and this is what I see with many athletes and in business, is I search with the two most tangible and obvious things as an athlete physically. Okay, I'm going to get myself physically so awesome that you're untouchable and then, and then technically. So if you can get the physical and technical, then then it's obviously it's a guarantee. It has to be a guarantee. So that was kind of the place I lived in for 10 years, that cycle of technical, physical, technical, physical. Yeah, and that uh, sort of instinct first data. So the technical and physical seems to be the science base. We can quantify it. Uh, it's mm. well-researched. If you look at the support staff in any professional environment, it's full of mm. anyone that can measure anything. Yet... It seems like when you moved into that professional environment, it actually got worse. So how do you think there's that mismatch between physical, technical, we're doing more all the time, yet what you want, the search, the goals, is not coming through? Yeah, it's a great point. I, and I think it's got worse. I think if I, if I certainly look at the athletes, oh, no, and the business owners, because they, they live in a world now where there's more data available, more analysis, more key at KPIs, more... But, but in, in, in football and sport in particular, I think science has a lot to answer for. You know, and I'm a big fan of Winston Churchill. And, and Winston Churchill said that his biggest fear for the 20th century was that science was science. Uh, I mean, he was talking at the time, of course, about development of an atom bomb after World War II. But he was saying that, you know, we, we, we need scientists, but we don't want a world full of scientists. That, and I thought, what a, and you actually look at that and you thought, that's brilliant. You know, we need scientists, but we don't, we don't want a world full of scientists. And, and what he was saying there is exactly what's happened I've seen in sport. We need scientists. I'm, I love the data. I've got my Apple Watch. I love the data. I, I think it's great. Um, but it's not, it's being abused and it's being, I think because the pain of losing for everybody involved, the fear of getting sacked in such an insecure world, what do people do with fear? They, they, they grab onto the life raft. They try and grab anything they can. And I think science is the tangible one. If we can get data, if we can get, it, it's proof. Science is meant to be evidence. Well, you, you, there's no evidence for, for spirit. There's no evidence for, for instinct. It's the one unreachable that man's tried to search for ever since dawn began. It's like that, that's that gap, that space where science can't quite get there. Um, and, and, and that's the bit, I think, that, that, that I, many, many others search for. Uh, why did I struggle more than others who still searched? I'm more sensitive. 
more sensitive, I think sensitive intelligence is it, it's more difficult because you, 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 I have got an intelligent brain, an analytical brain. So I will search there. Um, science is, is something that people grab onto. I think that and an ignorance is bliss. I was sharing that, that, you know, I wasn't ignorant. I am sensitive. I am intelligent and, 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 and I've got a logical brain. So I think, you know, A plus B does equal C. Um, black and white. I heard Johnny Wilkinson, the, the great legend of English rugby, talk about, you know, apologising for anybody that bought his book in 2003. You know, really sorry because you'll have just seen a really screwed up, dogmatic, black and white kind of mentality. So, so you mentioned the gift is the curse. And mm. when you talk about the gift, is that mm. that combination of being sensitive, but also that insatiable desire and drive to actually push to the next level and push yourself and continually get to what you, how good you know you can be. But how does that translate into being a curse? Yeah, it's funny as you as you're saying it. I'm thinking, yeah, there it is. That that is the curse. <laughs> that yeah. say say what you said again. <laughs> Let's see if you're really good. Say, 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 yeah, say it again if you can remember it. Oh, I don't actually remember what I said now, but the gift is yeah. Well, the gift is the curse. So yeah. the gift is that insatiable what? desire, and anyone that has that built into them, I think it's inherent. So that desire to actually push to be your best, and when you know that you've actually when you've seen it as a youngster, you've seen how good you can be, but mm, then that mm. goes away and that desire comes back in. But then how does that then become a curse to losing all those goals to actually creating that search all over again and it's not constructive? Well, I think as you just said then, you started off with the gift is the insatiable desire. And look at the words, insatiable. You know, nothing's ever enough. Nothing's ever enough. Desire is the strongest, the strongest emotion in mankind isn't it so you know nothing's ever enough strongest emotion in mankind I mean, that's it's a gift because it's going to drive you and drive you to nothing you know i i just saw a clip of ronaldo yesterday and i sent it to some guys i work with and, and young guys uh you know there he is at 35 and he was just doing a very simple drill that we all do you've done 10 year olds do it the best in the world do it pole there pole there 20 yards between each run to that one do a pass run to that one do a pass with somebody who's serving the ball the way he sprints between those two poles it's like someone's got his wife hostage at one end of those one end of those poles he's getting there he's getting there with everything he's got and that's the difference and and i see it missed all the time with coaches all the time oh we work hard enough we work hard enough yeah, you do, but that's next level. That that's that's the gift. That's the gift. Now, you know, do I have that same mentality as Ronaldo? Without doubt, what he has, God given, is everything. He he has the physical, he has the body, he has the he has the he has the DNA, he has the athleticism, the speed. He has, he's worked at his strength, his technique. He has everything. He has the full. There's nothing he's missing. But. I think the danger is a lot of young players will look at the best and then try and copy their, which is all accessible now. They can go on Instagram and find out these guys' training regimes and they can find out the technical work. It's all accessible. The bit they won't see is that, that, that gift. Now, you know, he, he manages that. Um, he, he manages that however he manages that. I, I, didn't, I didn't have the tools to manage that. Um, because when nothing's ever enough, nothing's ever enough, right? It, 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 it's as simple as that. Um, you know, you could score two goals, but you, 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 you could think you played really well, but you'll torture yourself about the one that you missed and you, it's not enough. Like, and, and, and then the voice will go, yeah, you, but you've got to go even more now. You've got to do more and nothing. You know, so it's this constant, it's an incredible gift because you, when you've got that, you will drag people up because like, wow, this level, this level is insane. And, and every coach I ever had, they, they recognize that in me, that leader type, that, that set the standard, that, you know, winner, um, first in the training ground every day, last one away. Um, young players, watch him, watch the way he lives his life, watch the way I'm, I'm really, I hope they didn't. I hope they didn't. I mean, it wasn't the right way. No, go, you know, if you want to go and have a beer and have a cigarette, go and have a beer and a cigarette. It's not, it's not going to kill anything. You, if it relaxes you and that's your thing, go and do it. So, yeah, I think just being able to not let go um, over control. 
get really it first. perfectionism, isn't it? And like we're working yeah. with a lot of female athletes and cricket's a killer of a sport as well in that you can have one ball and your whole day's gone. You failed, you're done. Yeah. So that yeah. need to control, I think, is even worse. It's magnified in the sense that if you if you miss a shot and goal, yet yeah, you'll be angry, but you have that opportunity to run hard, get the ball back and go again. I agree. Whereas I agree. in cricket, it's it's really tough. And that perfectionism where you talk about it's never enough and continuing it's just going like, okay, I scored 100 today, but I've got to score 100 tomorrow and I've got to do it again and I've got to score 200. And it's just a never-ending quest for the next thing. And... That's why I suppose that's the purpose of the podcast and what we're trying to create at the Inside Edge project is how do we actually then, so we, we know we need to work hard. You, sit, you talk about Ronaldo, you have to be able to work hard. That is a given. He's yeah, working at a level. So well, 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 it, well, it, well, it, well, it's a given, but also that, that it, it, it's pissed me off. Sorry, it's lovely grass blowing in the way of the, the camera. I'm sitting upstairs. Beautiful. I mean, but you know, it's, it's causing problems. Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, it, it, it's a given, but it's, it, that's something that used to really piss me off when coaches go, you know, boys, hard work's a given. I'm like, it's not a given. This is the biggest load of bullshit I've ever heard. Like, I'm looking around my teammates going, they don't work hard. Um, it's not a given. You know, I, I don't wake up every morning and think, right, I really want to hurt myself today, run about 10 kilometers, virtually vomit. Um, it's, I don't want to do that. I don't, show me a human being who really gets up every day and thinks, I really want physical pain you're crazy i mean psychopath maybe uh, so i think you have to you know say look the hard work has to that that's the biggest coaching piece for me because i think a lot of people think they work hard and they don't they don't they don't they don't work as hard as they should or as intensely as they should um, so that that is actually and if you look at, at the football jürgen klopp i guess at liverpool he's able to drag levels out of his players of intensity that other coaches can't they can't drag that out so I think there is levels of hard work um, and I think it's not a given. Um, and, and hence the Ronaldo pole thing, that's hard work. Like that intensity, that's this craziness inside him that borders on well, it, it, narcissism. Um, you know, if you looked at his character traits alongside a psycho psychopath serial killer, there'd probably be a lot of things very similar. So hard work's not given the best have an intensity, you know, um, but once the intensity's done, then yeah. Uh, sorry, I've gone off tangent there. It's a subject <laughs> that I'm really passionate about. The amount of times I've sat in dress rooms after games and you've lost and there's big, big inquisition and, People are getting dug out, and you, you, you know they're, they're, there's all this shaming and blaming going on, and you know, and, and you're thinking, well, I used to think well, intensity's been down all week, that, that training's been crap, and I, and I said it two or three times to coaches, look, you, you need to look at yourself in the mirror before you start coming at us. I mean, yeah, okay, we, whatever, we didn't play well today, but how about you? How, how about your standards all week? You know, and that never went down particularly well. Um, I think I'm a better coach than I probably was a player. I, I, but, but yeah, it, yeah, hard work, um, not a given. How do you then differentiate between the perfectionism being a negative thing, but that ability to actually really work hard? So if, if you need to work hard, like you, you're saying Cristiano Ronaldo is mm. at another level to everyone, mm. almost mm. psychopathic. But mm. then we have issues with the search and perfectionism and almost being too professional and doing too much. Where, where's the line between those two? Well, well, it's a brilliant question and there is one. And, and the danger is that the young generation only see the Instagram snaps. They only see the 4% body fat, 10 pack in the gym again, uh, they, free kit practicing, practicing technique. They think, my God, this, this guy must be at it all day long. And it's a myth. It's a myth. He's not. It, it, when he trains, he's intense. He's intense. But then, then he'll have a way of having his downtime, however he does that. So it's intense, let go, intense, let go, intense, let go. And I think just to have the intensity and then not be able to let go come performance time, and I think that's why he's the best, because then he can walk on the pitch and trust himself. That's the bit I think this is going to go to, this podcast, is you can have the intensity, you can have all the intensity you want, 
I, I had Ronaldo's level of intensity, no doubt about it. Any coach ever, who ever signed me, any player I played with, would all say the same thing. But my career was in the dirt and his was up here. Yeah, OK, some of that might be ability for sure. But he had an ability to trust himself and that's the difference. He trusted who he was. He didn't second guess it. There was times I'm sure he did, but... Um, so you know, your... I, think, I, I think for cricket, sorry, it's just got me thinking. It, it, it's... it's you know, because I've worked in golf and golf is similar, similar to cricket. Mate, 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 yeah, well, yeah, similar in terms of you've got that little ball and you've got to hit it and it can all go wrong and you can hit a great shot and it can get caught or you can hit a great shot and the wind can take it and you haven't even seen the wind when you're assessing the shot. And it's a difficult one, but once you've done that work, then the next body of work, and this is the work that I think I don't see athletes and organisations and coaching licences doing is 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 that i call it spiritual work but i guess that scares people uh, emotional work <laughs> you know it, it's doing that doing that work the kind of work i do with guys like look tell me when you were a kid give me give me six stories of when you did something really good oh, i play play cricket but it was a silly thing it was just at school i was eight it didn't really no 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 i don't care if it, you don't need a stadium there in a crowd tell me about when you played at eight what happened i just you know it was this one game and I was bowling, I took four wickets, then I went in bat, hit 19 sixes. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> what, what, what did you do? How did you do that? Well, I don't know. I was just in school and just loved it. And, and then at 10, I did, and then you know, I had this all the time. I just let them go. And at 12, and actually at 14, there was this one, and you get them, and, I go, and at the end, you go, cool. So you're pretty good, right? And that's when the silence stops. That's, that's when there's silence, because now I've asked them who they are. Are you pretty good? Well, you know, most people would probably answer, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm dead, 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 rather than just going, yes, yes, I am. And that's the bit I try and lead them to. Can you see that? Yeah, I can. Can you trust that? Can you, can you trust that? No, no one's put that. You've created those stories. I haven't. You, you've done that. So you can see you're talented, right? Yeah. So the only thing that's happening now is that now you're thinking about it. Now it's serious. Now you're a professional. Now all that crap. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if that makes sense. No, that's brilliant. And that's that right there is the number one issue. And I reckon the amount of conversations I've had with others and I've had with mentors has been around the exact same thing. It's like, oh, you're pretty good, right? Yep. And then did everything when I was a junior or at grade cricket. It's just a level below you're performing really well and then all of a sudden you've got to go to the next level or some some kids will go out to the under 18 national championships and I start thinking but look at that there I want to stop you that's a brilliant right on that thing you said there I think it's so key a switch in your head or somebody says to you or I was listening I was really listening to a podcast I did yesterday because I'm going out to see him soon Steve Corker in Turkey and Steve uh, Steve's had an incredible career and he you know he's found himself again now and uh, there was a moment that he says, you know, it, 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 same happened to him at 15, 16. Same happened to me when he, stepped, he was at Spurs and at Tottenham and he broke into the first team at 18 in England. And there was a moment where people went, it's serious now. Now you've got to step up the level. Now, what, and that, that moment there is the moment I work on with people. Who the hell? What, why? What's changed? What, what has changed? What, what I'm hearing, if you listen with your heart, not your ears, is going, that person is basically going, shit. Now jobs are at stake. Now there's money involved. That's what they're actually saying. Nothing's actually changed. Nothing's changed. It's just people sticking that. So that's the first part of the fear being put on somebody. Um, oh, it's the next level now. Yeah. Or I'm, or, or I'm a professional now. Well, now it gets serious. Why? What's yeah. changed? Well, what do you do in that moment? So, so a player's come to you and said, oh, I've made the big leagues. I've got to do this and I've yeah. got to do this. And there's so much to get to and it's a never-ending story. And we all know that the next season comes along, then it's the next division they want to crack. And it's the next thing. What do you do in that moment when a player does say something like that? Fears come in. What's the process to cut it in its tracks? Well, I'm aware that they're going to walk straight into an environment which nine times out of ten is going to be toxic. Um, toxic by the, the fear, fear. Fear is toxic. So if you imagine a, a pool of clear water and you drop in one 
drop of red ink into that water, it gets slightly clouded. Now, if you drop one bit of fear in to that pool of players in that training centre, it starts in the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And the great Phil Jackson from the Bulls and the Lakers talks of, you know, he understood having been a player himself, he understood that every single player in his team, the number one fear is being humiliated on the court. Being humiliated out there on the court, not performing. So he said, I'm fully aware of that. Then you've got the injuries. Then you've got the bonuses and the money they need for the families. And you've, so he said, before I've coached anything, that's what I have to work on because that, that's the number one thing. So I think, yeah, it's, I just prepare, I prepare these, these guys for knowing what they're going to walk into. You're going to have a meeting about this. You're going to be told you need to do this. Someone's going to go, it's serious now. You, you know, we need, we need to do this. In the next four games, we need two wins. We need, we need, we need, we need. Uh, yeah, well, what so, have you been programmed in instead of we need this, we need the fear? How, what's the language you used or the behaviours that you'd like to see that lead to more trust and confidence? I think just it's really simply the truth, um, which is for a coach, if, if I want to be successful this season, if I want the team to be successful, I need to win games. I need to win games. If we want to be successful, we need to win games. If you're, if your own personal career, you have desires to go on. You need, if you're, if you're a bat, if you're a batsman or a, a, a bats lady, bats. <laughs> Batsman's <laughs> fine. <laughs> I, was, I was politically incorrect there. Um, okay. So, so you, you, you want to go on, you're going to get, you have to get your numbers. If you're bowling, you're going to have to get your, like, let's just get that out. Like, of course, that's, that's just obvious. Like, if you want to be a, a doctor, then you're going to have to do well in chemistry at school. And like, that's just a given. So let's just get that out. We need to do that. You know, if we're going to do anything now, now's the gold dust. But really looking at what, what can we actually do about that? We, 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 nothing more than, than, than work really hard. And that's the bit that I think a lot of people don't do. They don't. And they, they might think they do, but they don't. They don't. That intensity. Um, so I think that's where the, the great coaches have wild intensity. They're, 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 they're loose characters, you know, they, they drag the team. So that intensity. And then, look, guys, that's one thing we can control. And the only other thing is having the courage to be yourself. In here, we'll talk about it. We'll, 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 we'll share. I'll share as the coach that, you know what, guys, I'm terrified. I had a meeting with the owner yesterday, and the owner said to me, look, I'll be honest with you, but you need to win three out of the next six. Otherwise, I'm going to be looking for a new coach. Just sharing that and going, I'm scared. And then, how are you feeling? Oh, I'm scared because I need to see. And just getting that fear out and going, okay, what can we do? Not much. Intensity. Trust yourself. Make a mistake. Don't go hiding. Um, you know, just starting to just talk, I think. Um, look at fear. Fear, fear, fear. Really get it all out. Um, Sounds like a base of vulnerability, isn't it? But Complete vulnerability. Complete vulnerability. And it seems to keep coming back to that. I mean, we listen to Legacy, James Kerr, uh, the All Blacks. Um, the amount, I could I'm a, go on for ages. I'm, 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 I'm doing a podcast with James Kerr in a few weeks. Oh, yeah. Time. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to talk about all of that stuff. Yeah, because that book is fantastic. Um, you know, I'm fascinated to know the insights with the All Blacks and... But again, you know, it's something that will get missed in that book. And I've, I've seen that book tot, tot around the business world as heralded as, as like the, the book. But really, if you look at the, the essence of what that book talks about and what he's talking about, it's that, it's, again, it's that spiritual place that the, the Maori, he, what the All Blacks did is went back to that Maori tradition, back to that ancestry. The hacker is about drawing the spirits up from the ground and people go, oh, I know it's just about this dance. No, 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 it's not a dance. It's to draw the spirits up from the ground to fill you with energy. To I mean, that's how much more spiritual do you want? Yeah. But because they've got Adidas gear on and muscles, like, no, no, it's because they... <laughs> uh, we actually had a good, a, a brilliant documentary. I'm not sure if you remember Kathy Freeman who ran the 400 yes, meters for Australia in yes, 2000 and the ABC here just released a brilliant documentary on her describing her run and the 400 meter final if you can find it online she goes straight to spirit and she had a quote probably going to butcher it here but it was something along the lines of 
I have my ancestors running with me. When she got, there's Olympic final, there's 100,000 people in the crowd. All she does is look up and feel her feet on the floor. And she says, I'm with my roots. I've got my ancestors all around me. No one else can catch me. No one's got anything <laughs> on me here because I have the whole cur like country and earth with me. And I think the point was, it's not that no one can reach me in terms of winning the, the actual no. race. It's more to the point of she can be f have the full courage to be herself and give everything, to run hard, to be present to her game plan and just see what happens. And it was unbelievable be to see and, that. And, and, and because, and I had this chat with a, with a client yesterday, because what she's done there is summoned a power greater than herself. Yeah. And this way you can flip it and dice it and turn it. But, you know, I heard Kobe Bryant talking about Phil Jackson and Kobe Bryant said that, you know, the, Phil Jackson was a genius and he led these top egos, these huge egos, Jordan and all these guys. He led them to spirit and spirituality. He said he, he's doing it with us. He's doing the meditation. He's doing as the head coach. He lives this life. He lives it and he's given it to us. And he said that, you know, the reason people put him down and the reason people laugh at that stuff, despite all his championship rings. And he said, it's because they haven't got, and this is the key. They haven't got the obsession or the desire to search for that extra place. Now that's the, that's the truth. You know, the people who don't want to go there haven't got the burning, they haven't got the gift of the desire to go there. They're just, they're happy sitting here. The, the, the steps that I do with, with, with clients, to the, the, there is a process, one, two, and three. And step one tends to be, you, you know, let's look at your performance right now. Do you admit you, 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 you're out, you can't control it anymore? You don't know what's going to come up out of your boots, off your bat, off your racket. You don't know, right? You, you're sick and tired of this up and down performance and not been able to find it. And do we agree? Is that why you're here? Yeah, that's why I'm here. Number two, do you take them back to all those performances as a kid, all those? Then, you know, naturally what, what brings from that conversation is, is a conversation about God, a God, a God of their understanding. I'm not, I'm not a Christian and I'm not affiliated to any religion, but, but I, I have a huge spiritual sense and, you know, I, I, I asked them, we, we talk about those questions. What's your belief? And, and then through there, then the next, the next phase is, you know, we have to start trusting that belief, like that thing. You have to start trusting that, um, that instinct, that, that, that thing. So how do you yeah, employ that with people that are really black and white? So we have a lot where it's okay. They get to a point where it's um, let's say, I've got to a point where I'm accepting that I'm so inconsistent. I've tried everything. I've tried all the science. I've tried all the technique. I admit that I'm out of control. Uh -huh. But then there's a block in the ability to actually go to, as soon as you say the word spiritual or mm. whatever it is, it's just like, nah, walls up. I'm not going there. How do you? So, I, so I, I don't you. I'm using that word with you, but I don't chuck that out. I, I sense it. Where Where's it all at? I mean, I was working with a player a year ago. It's, it, surprising he was 28 a seasoned international you know millionaire international i'm thinking you know drew can we i, I, I want to have a chat with you sure what do you want to talk about well, just this performance I said, come on man you are you joking me like you, you're in the premier league every week you're playing for your country like you, you're multi-millions you've got nothing to worry about like, all's good he said no it's not he said like there's 10 percent, maybe more that i'm uh, that i've got in my in me and i can't get it out and i'm just kind of on the edge of games and i'm not and we talked, and many players I've talked with said they reckon most Premier League players are only ever at 60% of their, of their best. 60%, you know, and yeah. only the best ones untap that bit. So I didn't lead him straight to spirit because he wasn't, he's not, he's not wired that way. He's quite, you know, but so I just talked to him about when, when his great games were and what, what, what he did. And he said, I just used to, I used to just play, used to play and pick the ball up and sit and drive and see things. And now I'm just laying it off, keeping it simple. And why? Well, you know, I think that was a lot of instruction from the coaches there. This is the way we play. We don't want you doing this. Very controlling. Um, which again, couldn't be not because they've been successful. So you can, but I said, look, you have to break free of the control. It's like a relationship. If you're in a relationship with the other partners controlling, you're going to break. I'm going to advise you get out of that. So I said, you've got to break out of it. Now, here's the hard thing. You can't tell anybody you're breaking out of it. I wouldn't suggest this conversation ever goes any further. But we're going to speak in the shadows about how to do that. So you're going to ring me game day just before you meet up and you've done all the tactical work. And 
how you're feeling. Yeah, he told me he wanted me to do this and do this. Okay, I said, you, you're going to go out there today and your instinct, what do you do? What are you about? He said, I'm about this. This is what my game is. You're going to go and do that. We have to talk about it now. So there's one objective that when that ball, you are going to go and do you today. You have to, that's all I'm judging by today. Bye. And we'll talk afterwards. You're going to go and do that. Now, you'll fail in doing that. And because you've defied the, the instructions and done it, you're going to get shouted at. It's the way you, you know it's coming. You're 28. You've been around. I said, then you have to go and do it again. And you're going to get shouted at. Then you have to go and do it again. And then you'll make something happen. And you'll create a goal. And the manager will be wolf whistling down the touchline above the crescendo of the crowd. Brilliant. Brilliant. Because it happened to me. And you'll think, brilliant. I've ignored every single thing you've told me all week. But I, won't. I said, that's when... When, when, why are footballers and all these guys and sportsmen and addicts and because well, they're having to listen to that and, and, and it's crazy making so I've just defied everything ignored every instruction you've given me then you've just told me brilliant for listening to all the instructions I mean it's it's the sickest behavior you'll ever hear I mean it's crazy <laughs> isn't it I mean it's just absolute insanity oh, I absolutely so, connect to that yeah so, so right. So that that that's. I don't have to go to the spiritual place with them. You just kind of go. Well, who are? Because spiritual. What, what does that mean? It means who are you? At source. That that that. Who are you? Well, I'm this player. We'll go and do that then. But you know, you have to know what you're gonna. You're gonna be walking into it. It takes courage, and this is the thing about courage. It takes courage, and the great managers, the great coaches, give their players that courage. Yeah. Because because that because they have courage. Yeah. And most coaches, I say, most leaders, most, most people, it's this kind of thing I'm talking about fear at the moment, they're fear-based. Yeah. But I was speaking to a player I worked with the other day, and he was like, you know, when we started working, he said, I'd never have known. If you'd have said to me, am I scared? I'd be like, no, not really. He said, but every single thing in my game was about fear, wasn't it? Everything in my life was about fear. He said, I'd never have known I was scared. I said, fear is so subtle. It's not, oh, look, there's a tiger in the room. With, yeah, now I'm scared. It's so subtle. It's all these layers of fear that are buried and you've, you've masked over them. I don't know if that makes sense. No, it definitely does. And would your method for working with a manager or a coach be different to a player? Because I've come across a fair few coaches where they're, they're so scared of failing. So they talk all the right things. Let's commit to process. Let's work hard. Let's do all these things. And then come game day, they're like <laughs> an absolute ball of an anxious mess. It's one of the funniest uh, things I've ever seen. And it's like, actually... Our girls here are pretty excited. We're ready to go. But the coach is the one that's actually causing half the stress. Is the process the same? Brilliant. Uh, I've worked with two coaches at professional clubs. One was documented because I went into Mansfield Town and worked with the manager there. And look, tr truth, truth was, he's riddled with fear. He's an old teammate of mine. He's a really nice guy. Um, the staff he had around him, riddled with fear. It's like cancer fear. It grows. And it, they're all, so they're all fear cancer patients riddled with this stuff and would never know it would never know it got the nice car and and um there was a moment on match so i'd go in a couple of days a week and match day I'd, I'd go in i'd be sitting in the manager's office on match day and you know you'd be watching you know sandwiches or eating a sandwich looking at team selection and two of them are pacing up and down and i'm kind of sitting them and i i smoke cigars now and so i i can i can i smoke and they're like no you can't you can't smoke i'm like oh cool okay well i won't do that then so they're, they're pacing up and down. And, and, I'm, and one, I said to the manager after two or three games, I won't be coming before the game. I'm going to come like uh, 20 minutes before kickoff. No, no, I want, I want you around it. I said, mate, I'm, I can't be around this shit. He said, well, he goes, just this fear. I said, it's the ugliest thing I've ever seen. I said, pacing up and down and in the office. I said, that energy, you're going to go take that energy into the dressing room. I said, you, you have no chance of, of any success here. You know, I don't care how good your tactics are and your nice glossy tactics board and all your preparation and your sports scientists and your data and your heart rate monitors and your urine tests and your fucking like, everything else you're doing. It's a waste of time. Like, fear is derailing everything. And he's like, that's why I brought you here, mate. You have a completely different view. But how do, how do I stop that fear? I said, well, that's on you, man. Like, I'm, I'm here for you. Like, we, I'll talk to you about that. You know, we'll, we'll, but you have to understand that they're, they're all shitting themselves. They all have to go and perform. They've all got to walk down that tunnel into the cauldron of hate and they have to go and find the, the trust within themselves. So you have to, you know, but, but it was. And, and, and ultimately, the reason he lost his job and I walked away before the end of that is because there was too many around people around him who were riddled with fear. And it was difficult. Like, 
so the whole energy you need to shift the energy get it out and you know it was it was never really going to work but yeah I, 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 there's a lot of ego with coaches though I think because they're because they're, they're older yeah. we're ex-players we know we know what it takes and we, we're all you're just like me Drew. you're just another ex-player and we, we we know what I'm like yes we played but no there's a whole different thing so um I think, you know, I think coach education has to be strong. It has to change. I think the leaders that write that stuff need to write a whole, whole nother year onto it on, on all those ex-players, which most coaches are ex-players. They need to go and undo all their trauma, all the days they lost it out there on the pitch. They, they shit themselves. They didn't play well. They got booed. They got humiliated, laughed at, mocked, lost contracts. Let's go and work through all that stuff. Now you're ready to coach rather than just, you're an ex-player, let's go. Right. Yeah, that's brilliant. And I suppose if you don't do that work, it does, you said the manager you're talking about lost his job and it leads you to a place where you're going to end up losing anyway. So You lose, it's, it's a guarantee. Yeah. And, and this is why in England, there's this circle of this merry-go-round of coaches. You know, the last three or four months, get sacked, next one's in, might get a year, sack, next one's in. And, you know, I'm not saying you could break that circle with this way of thinking, but I, t I tell you why, 90% of that is, is, is the fear. And, and if you look at Klopp, at Liverpool, for example, you know, you've taken on an institution there. You've taken on more than a football club. You, you carry the weight of a city on your shoulders, a huge powerhouse in global football. And he's done it. And, and if there's one thing he, he does exceptionally naturally well, and he talks a lot about his Christian faith and that's his, that's his faith. That's the faith that he chooses, that's where he gets his trust. And, you know, his one thing above all, he's got many things, but the one thing I think that sets him apart is his ability to laugh at fear. And it, so when fear's on all the other coaches, he's there going, yeah, like the big German laugh that he has and just yeah. that whole aura. Imagine being around that on match day when you're in the dressing room and he's in there laughing and uh, you just like, oh, you know, it's... so he, he, he and, and the reason he's the best is because he's wild on his intensity. I mean, some of the stories you hear from the players, he's, he's that Ronaldo level. His, his, his demand for running is next level. Like, whereas most coaches say, oh, that player's run really well to shut the ball down. He's got another 30% on what he demands. He's like, you're going to go there. Like, your life depends on it. And if you don't, I'm not going to shout at you. I'll just move someone else in who can do that job. So the players have the good fear, good fear of like, shit, I love, the, I love the boss, but if I don't go with my life depends on it, I'm done. He's not going to shout at me. I'm just done. So I better step up. And if you can't step up, then the club will sell you and we'll find someone who can. Um, so he's got a perfect balance of intensity and then laughing at the fear. And I think that's the ultimate, isn't it? Yeah, that, that's brilliant. And it reminds me of what you talk about in your book about when you were in the tunnel, the difference between your performances standing in the tunnel ready to go out. So in one point, you're fully focused, game face, not looking at anyone's serious time to go. One Another point, 99% of the time, I think I was in that place. <laughs> <laughs> and that probably explains a bit. Um, yeah. And then, so the times that you were you did have those breakout unbelievable performances. You rediscovered childhood Drew. What was the mm. difference for you standing in that tunnel compared to the other so, 99%? What I'd done, I didn't realise it was that at the time, but I'd surrendered. I'd surrendered. I'd surrendered to the pressure. I surrendered to my utter powerlessness over anything that was going to happen out there other than sweat and the ability to be myself. It usually came on the back of a real six to eight week period of just out the team, broken searching to the point where my ego finally got broken and I was just like I I'm done I, I just want to play football I, I just want to play like I did as a kid I just want to I'm just going to play and if I get picked I'm just going to play man and whatever's going to be is going to be and you're sitting in there and the buzzer goes and everyone's up come on let's go and pumping their chest and the, and the coaches are you ready and you know I, I, I'm six foot three so I'm one of the big alpha male characters and <clears throat> kind of sitting there like this cross-legged and I see the staff all whispering, is he all right? Is he all right? Big man, are you okay? Are you okay? Yeah, 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 I'm good, man. I'm good. And I go to the sink, put some water on my face, and they're whispering. He's, he's usually the one at the front. Like, why, why is he so? And then I'm in the tunnel, just leaning against the wall, like leaning against the wall rather than up there. And, and, uh, and just, you know, let's go. 
it's, I, I don't have to find aggression. You know, I don't have to find anything. There's nothing to find in here. Um, you know, if the time comes and, 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 you know, I've got no energy and I'm really blowing and I feel on my knees and let's look at the scoreboard, there's 20 minutes to go. I have something in me that will drive through that. That's, I don't have to find that. It's there. I can trust it. It's there. It's who I am. You know, I, I see it in my daughter now. She has that. You know, it's, uh, you set her a project, it, it, she's going to do it. She's going to do it with crazy intensity and it's great. Love it. Well, that's who you are. It's come back to who, who you are. are. That's you. And, and, and so by surrendering, I'd surrender to this. I'd just, I'd quit. I'd quit thinking. I just, it was almost like at the moments, the brain was off, done, off, done, done. So then how do you, because your, your career was quite the roller coaster. So you've oh, surrendered, yeah. you've stopped thinking, you're trusting in yourself as a human. I was brilliant then. And you were brilliant then. <laughs> you're scoring your eight goals in... 10 weeks or whatever it is. Fucking hell, you score eight goals in four games, yeah. There you go. And, then, 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 not, then not score for eight, eight months. <laughs> so what ha what's the transition period? How do you go from being in <laughs> it'd be the like, it'd, it'd, it'd be like... It'd be like, it'd be like, you know, being the best husband ever, coming every day, flowers, talking, listening to my wife's conversation, doing whatever. Then all of a sudden, I don't come back for eight months, cheating on her every night, <laughs> going out drinking with the guys. Like, you can imagine, but that's the relationship. So that's the coach looking at me going... You, you, and, and I genuinely, that's what happened with coaches. They would, they would get to a point where they just loathe me because they're like, you, you are, I, it was said to me, you're, you're deceitful. And I was like, what do you mean I'm deceitful? Well, well you, 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 you deliver this and then you just, you just, you, you deceived us. You, you tricked me into fighting for you to get more money with the board. I got you a better contract because like, it, we need to keep this guy. He's the bedrock of everything we're going to do this year. And then you just do that, you know, so it, it, it was really the shame that would be put on me afterwards. It just would break me even more because I didn't deliberately do that. I just So what would happen? I'd go in, I'd be brilliant, surrender. There might be another game, I'd do it again. And then I'd be at the top of the pile again. I'd be up here, everyone's like, the, the press want to speak to you, the manager's stepping out of your way, asking you if you want any extra days off. Is there anything I can do for you? <laughs> you know, uh, uh, and then this little voice... This little monkey on my shoulder would go, yeah, well done, mate. You, you, you keep doing this. You keep thinking, yeah, you just little surrender and you walk around and life's all cool and you're all, yeah, happy, clappy. Good luck with that. That's, that's not what the best do. The best, the best. If you want to be the best, the best, live it, eat it, sleep it. And I'd go, and, I, and I'd go, yeah, yeah, you're right. Like, I can't maintain this. It's only been five games. I need, I need now to maintain this and go to the next level. I need to go now. I'm, I've got back here. Now I need to go all serious again. Boom, wheels fall off. 17 years of that. Fascinating. 17 years of that. Fucking hell. Jeez. Can't and believe, that did end up. Believe, I can't, pretty can't much believe I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm quite impressed. Oh, it snapped me in half. Like, it snapped me in half. It, it, look, it, it, I'd spend all my money, you know, trying to, trying to make myself feel better, buying a better car, watch, clothes, just ego, just to, just to feel some kind of power. I. I, I I cheat on all my girlfriends because you know, getting getting another a girl to like me would be oh yeah I must be important I I am good I am good look look what I can do I'm the man I'm the man just this broken little boy running around, you know just destroying himself emotionally destroying myself. Um, what was yeah. the final straw? So what what caused you to actually go and get some help? Well, I think. Um, I was at Lincoln City in League Two, the big football club. I'm glad they're back up now. And uh, I, was, I was by the time I signed that contract, I, I, just, I was running on fumes. Like I didn't have much belief left, and then obviously didn't play well. And then another manager who's brought me in as a top paid player. You're the guy. He's, we had a relationship from years back, so he was. It was his first managerial role after finishing playing, and he'd had a top career. So he's like, "You are. You are going to be my identity on the pitch. All that stuff." I, I didn't have anything left in the tank so of course he turned on me very quickly and he turned hard in front of the dressing room be called a coward this all this stuff and I was struggling anyway and and that was just just destroying me and I was in a I was sat in lay as many days for three four hours after training and just thought about taking my car in front of a lorry I, I didn't do it by the grace of God I was in a bad place um recently got married um you know all that depression and that 
the frightening things with depression, you isolate yourself. So even though I'd be in that relationship, it'd be like being in a relationship with a corpse. I mean, I was just, I'd just sit there, I'd be quiet and difficult. And, uh, you know, my wife at the time was struggling and then the career finishes. Lincoln City got relegated from the, from the football, from the professional divisions down to the terrible, you know, it was last day of the season, 16,000 fans booing, throwing things at the car. It was tough. And then I was just done. The, the 32, no, no, I rang my agent that summer to say, okay, what? And he just went quiet. He said, Drew, I, I don't know where to tell you this. He said, your, your name's not good, man. He said, like, I, everyone I speak to, it's not. No one's going to take a risk on you anymore. You know, you, they took a risk on you for 15 years. It's a testament to how good you were on your good day, but you're done. Like, you, I don't know what to tell you. And um, put the phone down and had no money. Con uh, I was living paycheck to paycheck because I was paying off big debts every month. And um, yeah, I, I very luckily a friend of mine who I'd seen he worked for the Professional Football Association, the Players Union, heading up, heading up Sporting Chance. He was a former addict, and I rang him up, and he, he put me in touch with the, the rehab clinic, and I went down there, and um, yeah, J James, the head therapist, because they couldn't really label me an alcoholic because you know beer, I, I could take or leave a beer. I, it wasn't really gambling, um, and all the other obvious addictions. There was no drugs. There was no. But, you know, after doing his clinical assessment as a head psychotherapist, he said, without doubt, you have every trait of the most severe heroin addict I've ever met. You, you, we start yeah. here on Monday. You'll be you, right. So and actually, once we were in there, we just figured it out in therapy and group therapy. And, you know, you, you realize that actually all, all addictions um, and I've been around a lot of, you know, alcoholism now and the AA fellowships and all addictions come from a slow loss of self. And you lose yourself and you use alcohol to fill the pain and you pour it in and you pour it in to cover up, to fill, to fill up all that emptiness. And of course you go to sleep or you, you wake up the next day, you need to fill it, fill it again because you're still left with the emptiness. They call it the hole in the soul and that, that, that hole, you can gamble on it. will give you a quick escapism. You can take drugs to give you a high. You can, but, but actually you can't fix it until you deal with, with it. So um, yeah, I, I went through that whole process, which, you know, I'm very, very looking back today, everything I have in my life today, I'm blessed is because of that process. Um, and I guess I, I take that process and everything that I've learned and try and, you know, give, give it to, give it to guys before they, before they fall off the, and I don't think you need to go there. I don't think you need to go to rock bottom to, 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 to solve that. I don't think you do. Wow. That's an incredible story. And how do you actually fill that hole? I suppose now what's changed in your life? to not rely on addiction? So I, uh, I fill it with spirituality, with the, with the universe. I fill it with, you know, it's, I study biomechanics and injuries and human movements. So the first time, my first business post playing was looking at injuries. You know, I'd, I've worked with some of the best players in this country and, and kept them out of surgery by looking at the foot and the hip and all this stuff. I'm very blessed for that. But you know, I, I, I compare, if you look at a pain or you, someone's getting patellar tendonitis or a knee pain, or well, they've had ACL surgery repair, it's, it's all the same stuff. Like if you've had serious trauma on your body, you're an athlete and you've had two ACL reconstructions, then I'm sorry, you're going to need to get yourself in the gym every morning for half an hour before anybody's even in there because you're starting from minus five. So you need to get up to, because of that trauma. And so I, I view, I view the, the emotional side exactly the same, you know, a lot of trauma. So you know, I have to do work every day. So I, I, I'm not perfect. There's days I miss it, but I know when I'm missing it because I start to feel anxious. I start to feel fearful. I start to over control and I'll catch myself and go, what have you done the last couple of days? So I've been working. I'll justify it to myself. And you know, there's, an, there's a saying that, you know, whatever you put before your spirit, be prepared to lose. And I, and I love that. You know, whatever you, you put money before that, you make money of God, you, you, you'll lose all that. You, you, you put your wife before that, I say to my wife, if I put you and my kids before me, we don't have a marriage. I'm not a great father. So I have to get up every morning at 10 to 6. I go down to my office and I, I've got some apps, but I've got you know, loads of different books, meditation books and spiritual readings. And I read for 20 minutes and, and just fill my soul with the truth. And then I do meditation for 15 minutes. And then I do some breathing exercises. Then I do my gratitude list, spend time doing that. It's about an hour. So I do, I do that every morning. Um, and like I say, I just compare it to the physical stuff. Like, you want to be a great bowler, well, go in early and do an hour. Like, if, if I want to be in spiritually, spiritual great condition, then do the work. Um, That's unbelievable. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's funny, we've had two, two coaches on the podcast so far, both males, probably both about six foot three, <laughs> in, <laughs> and come from the alpha world. And mm. without knowing either way, both of you have touched on the spiritual practice, and it's probably the last thing I would have picked mm. as what holds everything together in... Yeah. Actually, so you, you can say it's to achieve things, but it's also let's just live a good life to start with. It's, it's, it, 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 you know, and again, you go back to the All Blacks and, the, you know, we're from the earth. You know, if you listen, uh, if you listen to what the hacker is, what does it say? To was, to was, from the earth, back to the earth, you know, whatever. You know, it, it's like that understanding that, that you know, we, we're just so, we're just so pathetically tiny, infinite little creatures who are just going to die into the dust like we're not that important so you know it, it just humbling yourself and grounding yourself and anchoring yourself in that place and understanding that oh wow yeah just give me a five-year contract on 10 million a year and oh, wow that's that's interesting oh, they must have just recognized that i've been given these lovely talents and i think that's where you see the best in the world from usain bolt before the races to messy after yeah. he scores yeah well yeah i mean like i say it's not about god and jesus and the bible or it's not about the quran and find whatever you want to find but it, you know be quick to see that be quick to see that the whole world is built off the foundations of spirituality you know every law is written off every everything is based off the original teachings of all these great people so um you know i'm certainly not going to ignore that perspective perspective is everything and i'm just wary of time here so um yeah. before i ask my final question as well it's been a brilliant conversation um you're doing some really great stuff you've got the lion's den coming up there's your well book. i think so we're, we're just renaming it i think but, all but, right but yeah i think yeah i think i was told by a guy who's helping me create all that and does branding so it's a bit cheesy i don't really like the lion's <laughs> den i said i really love that and he's like no nah, i don't really like that let's just have an area of your new site that's just this this area where there's going to be all this content in. I'm, I'm building it all out. And um, there's going to be a daily withdrew where I video my morning stuff and, and yeah. share back on, you know, so people can pick that up at any time of the day. If they're thinking, you know, what's Drew saying today? And, and I might be talking about whatever I've read on fear or ego or desire or, yeah. So, yeah, building all that out. So my biggest thing is for, for guys like you, guys like me, guys like all these young 10, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 year olds, 17 year olds who are in locker rooms before the game, I, the, the, the you know, I'm busy with the one-to-one -one stuff, but like on a smartphone, if they were struggling and, and they can go into the toilet, shut the door, sit on the seat, headphones in, and inside this community-based thing, I'm, I've come up with nearly 200 pain points, brilliant in training, crap in matches, um, make a mistake and just freeze. So oh, I've come about two, 300 of these and you can just click on it and it opens a video of me talking about it someone famous talking about it a couple of little questions to ask yourself and i thought the desire was imagine if they're sitting in a locker room now with a smartphone if i'd have had that and gone i'm struggling i'm not getting it from my coach bang i'm going to open that up and see what it might just buy somebody that i mean that video that you posted that one i made about the book that 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 was my story i'm sitting in the toilet you know and, and if someone could have just given me that that just something at that point you know brilliant i really like it um, and mm. to follow you on social media, probably the best place to start. And I'm sure we'll be able to stay in contact. And if anyone listening does connect with this and sort of speaks to them like it did to me, I can guarantee it did change the way I go about everything. Um, so I highly recommend doing that. And our, my final question for you, which is basically what we've talked about since the start, which is who is Drew at his best? Who is me at my best? Well, who am I? I'm, I'm, I have wild drive and ambition, fierce competitor, um, hugely sensitive, hugely empathetic, feel everything, compassionate. I'm kind. Uh, I have a huge ego, if not checked. The ego is as big as the humility. So that, that's who I am. Um, you know, just trying to be, be the best version of that every single day. Ch channel the desire and aggression. Um, keep being sensitive don't block my feelings off so yeah um, whatever whatever the universe brings me on the back of that great brilliant I love it I love your work and as I said you're doing some great work for the people in your life and now expanding to the whole world around you and thank you so much for uh, your time Drew 
Yeah, thanks for your time. Really appreciate that. Thank you. No worries. Thanks for tuning in. If you want to continue to be part of the Inside Edge project, hit subscribe or leave a comment below. We're also on all major social media platforms. I look forward to having you along next time.